Mr. Slav will share a few words first, and then we will have a conversation, questions from the audience, and answers from Mrs. Slav. Go ahead. <coughs> Hi. Uh, I want to thank my team. It's always very important to me. Uh, I survived because of them, repeating all of for us in the city I want to thank you for being here because I know I work in the news, so I know we every day we get bombarded by um, tragedies, especially these days. And uh, it's very easy and very human to stop caring and to turn away. But I think that the worst, the worst the world becomes around us, the more we have to care, the more we have to get engaged and uh, not turn away. So I thank you for not turning away and being here. Um, the war is still going on. It's not less, uh, if, even if you don't see it much on the news, it doesn't mean it's less intensive. Uh, same thing that happened to Mariupol happened to other cities, Bakhmut, Solidar, Bulidar, Marinka, Papasna, Volnavaka, and now it's happening to Adiyevka. So it is a system, it's a strategy uh, that Russia uses to take the cities. And the strategy is used in Aleppo, and the strategy is used in Grozny, and it will be easy in future. And uh, uh, there are 40, at least 40,000 graves right now in uh, a village called Stary Krim on the outskirts of Mariupol. And some of those graves have more than uh, one body. And those are people who died because of shellings and fires, but also because of the lack of medical attention and diseases that came after and during and after the siege, because of the siege hunger, suicides, a lot of suicides back then in Mariupol. So, um, yeah. I feel quite pessimistic today, sorry. But there is always hope. Here's what I want to tell you. Um, when we showed this film to people of Mariupol, who lost everything, and can't come back to their homes, and uh, the only image of their city is in their hearts. And I thought it's going to be very hard for them to see the film. And it was, of course. But when they came out of the cinema, they said they feel hope. And I first didn't understand what that means. How, how is that? How, how, how do they feel hope? How, where did they find it? And they told me, this is hard. You see, every moment we see some of our fellow citizens, some of our friends and families suffer or lose someone. Uh, they're never alone. They, they always have someone near to, to support them. There's a doctor and a volunteer, a neighbor, firefighter, journalist. There's always someone who will hold your hand and in the worst moments of your life will support you and that's the community and the hope is coming from this community that is formed through through suffering and through struggle through resilience and this community inspires me this sense of community inspires me and i think it is forming this community and feeling this community uh is a first step for is a first step for recovery, for reconstruction, for um, for getting back to life. Some questions from the Swedish audience. 
Who can pass the mic? Uh, yeah, yes, raise your hand, please. I'll tell you a couple of stories. Uh, the boy on the sad ones and, and good ones. So the boy who you saw uh, in um, after the maternity hospital bombing, who was looking for his mom. So his mom was injured. She had her face was injured with shrapnel, and his father was injured. So he'd been taken to the hospital, and his sister was with him. With him, she was pregnant and. Uh, in a few days, she gave birth to a healthy child, and they spent several weeks in in a basement. And um, uh, when the Green Corridor was open, uh, they tried to leave. They could leave only towards Russia. They couldn't leave because the child didn't have uh, a birth certificate, and she didn't want to make a Russian birth certificate. So she had difficulty of leaving the city. It was a very, very hard time. They spent like a month. Uh, together with this boy and with her newborn, just to try to, to get out. Eventually, they uh, did uh, get out to Russia and uh, made their way uh, through Estonia all the way to, to Germany. And they recently, we recently met them, uh, we found them, and they're okay. They're, they feel much better. Um, the doctors have left the hospital. Um, two days after uh, the hospital was occupied. The tank did shoot at the place we were sitting, just right under under the floor we were sitting, and they killed, unfortunately, a patient. And uh, then the tank, tank driver ran into the hospital, and he was like, what did I do? And he saw that he killed the patient, and he ran away. Uh, we know the name of that person. Uh, we investigated, and now we know who is that. Uh, but the doctors left, and uh, they reopened the hospital, my valuable hospital in Kiev. Vladimir uh, is uh, Vladimir continued working in um, Donbas, helping people. Um, unfortunately, he was injured very heavily uh, about uh, one month and a half ago. Uh, he had. Um, Shrapnel piercing his lungs uh, with a double tap of a Russian rocket when he was helping civilians in, uh, in the place of the shelling. He's uh, going through recovery now, but he'll be he'll, he's a he's a strong man. He uh, he will he'll be fine. We have a question with the microphone. Thank you very much for the for sharing this film with us. I, I don't think there are any like dry eyes in this room right now. Um, I'm just wondering what goes through your mind when you see this film yourself? I've seen it many times, uh, of course, many times uh, while I was editing it. So the editing process was um, about a year in total. So you can imagine, I, I remember every shot that is on screen and it's not on the screen. In total, was about 30 hours of footage. Not that much for a, a documentary, actually. More than documentaries would get two, three hundred hours of material. This is only 30 hours. But considering that only about 40 minutes was published uh, during the siege, it was quite important to actually get more, uh, more context to the audience, more, uh, more stories. Uh, and uh, I, uh, we started working on the film in, uh, in the end of March. And uh, I went to Bucha and I went to Kharkiv. So it was kind of a very, very, very strange and very hard moment because Kharkiv is my hometown. It was heavily bombarded. Uh, so during the day, actually, 4 o'clock, that's where we met. Four, you remember, 4 o'clock in the morning, it's like a schedule. Two rockets would hit Kharkiv, right? Two rockets. And then at four, like 3.55, you would wake up and you go somewhere in the basement and you would just wait for these rockets to hit. And then you go and film it. And then during the day, one of the neighborhoods would be heavily shelled and there would be a lot of casualties. So with all that, uh, with all that in mind, I would be coming back to 
uh, place where we stayed and start editing a film with editor who was in uh, in US at that point. So like 24 hours of 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 tragedy and that that almost killed me. Like that almost dis destroyed me. Those that that month. Uh, but there was a sense of importance of this. There was a sense of urgency and a meaning. So it kind of helped me to get through. And Kharkiv at that moment actually was uh, slowly pushing, uh, Ukrainian forces were slowly pushing away uh, Russians from the city. So it felt like this time it's different. It, it was also kind of hopeful uh, at that moment. Uh, so. A lot of different killings, and, and the next moment when I really was worried is when the film actually went to cinemas. It went. Uh, it was at the Sundance Festival uh, a year ago, and uh, I was afraid people would just walk out of the cinema because that's what you know. Some of the editors kind of told me, "Oh, this is one. This is too hard. People just walk out." Nobody did. Nobody did. Thank you that you did. Please raise your hand, thank you. Can we get a microphone over there, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, what do you think will happen in Ukraine? I mean, with the war in the future? Yeah. I'm not an oracle, you know. Uh, so it's hard for me to, to, to do a long-term analysis. Uh, the battle is very hard much harder that Ukrainian military and Ukrainian residents would be hoping for. But it's quite natural when you fight with the enemy which is much bigger than you and then the longer run it's, it has more resources. So uh, what I know for sure that, and when I say this it means uh, I am spending almost all the time now in Ukraine on the front lines so I keep filming. I, I was filming during the whole uh, counter-offensive, uh, speaking to uh, civilians and military. And what I know for sure that regardless of how hard how hard it is, how many weapons they are, uh, people will not stop resisting and fighting. People will not stop hoping to liberate uh, their land because there was. Every Ukrainian lost someone. Every Ukrainian has someone in the military. There is so much damage has been done to every single person that uh, surrendering is just not an option. And all Ukrainians know that as soon as you uh, give Russia an opportunity to feel weakness, uh, it will. They will do uh, the same thing they did. You know, in Bucha, the same thing they did in Mariupol, Kherson, Izum. So, we are speaking about tortures and occupied territories, arrests, uh, depriving children of their identities. So, these are all stakes. Okay, these are not just stories, these are stakes for Ukrainians to fight. And, um, but of course, everyone wants peace. Yeah. But they know that uh, sometimes you have to pay a very big price, big price for that. So it will be very, very hard to fight on the long run, and it, it it feels like it's going to be a long run because it also feels like for Russia this is this even existence of this war is is a guarantee of stability of its regime, and not only that, uh, we just spoke yesterday. Uh, about this. Uh, when Russia wanted to take Ukraine in three days, it was quite simple for them to invent quite silly reasons like denazification or whatever. Uh, but that doesn't work on the long run for Russia. So they have to raise the stakes. They have to come up with a better uh, excuses why they are at war for such a long time with Ukraine. Um, and uh, what I'm noticing right now in the Russian narrative, if you watch uh, TV or if you watch, if you analyze Russian news, and Ukrainians see that, we, we all read, we read this, we, we know what, what their narratives are. 
and their narratives are they don't fight with ukrainians anymore they are at war with europe and us they're like openly stating for their own people that the purpose of their government is to fight with europe and with us so they don't even consider ukraine as a an enemy now they uh, just fighting with ukrainians but they actually at war with europe and uh, ukrainians also understand that hi um, my name is hoa and i am currently working at the, for the swedish defense um, specifically with the personal equipment and generic quality but now being in this room wearing this uniform i feel like i have to say something um, what do you expect us to do now? Because everyone in this room, for me, now has a responsibility to keep sharing the footage that you have gathered together with your team. Um, how do you wish for us to do that in the right way, so to speak? Um, because I don't want us to leave this room without taking any actions, because people have sacrificed so much and you and your team bringing this to the world how do we continue thanks for this question um and i have many answers for you i would like i could come up with a list actually but i'm not gonna do that because it is up to it's not my in intent to to force anyone or to to ask anyone or to uh, my intent is to, sh to share what i've seen and uh, i think everyone has to decide for themselves of, of what exactly they are committing to and how exactly they're committing to it's a it's a part of a it's a part of a path what i can say is uh what i what i'm noticing not here but when i'm in general i'm traveling Quite a, quite a lot when I'm not in Ukraine and what I am sadly noticing is what I told you in the beginning there is a lot of and it's quite natural and understandable there's a lot of indifference and that was actually scares me the most because indifference in the first place have allowed Russian government not only indifference of course the support of of its people but the support of Russian people uh, to their government it's largely based on their indifference to what the government does so uh the indifference allowed russia to to attack their neighbor without uh, any major protests or even resistance from its citizens who part of who were probably not agreeing with this but the same goes for any country more there is indifference um, worse there will be consequences in the future so what i'm saying is that what what i could only tell you is to fight the indifference uh, in people around you and uh, that's that's really a lot and i think if everyone everyone in the society will care in european society in u.s society just or around the world a lot of problems will probably not be resolved but probably we will prevent more uh, of of try we prevent more tragedies Mariupol already happened so our job is my job is to make sure it's remembered but also I would like this never happen again please raise your hand yes yeah Very thank you my name is Sven Bergen. I'm one of the volunteers supporting Ukraine today. Thank you. And, and I do believe there's a lot of volunteers in here today. I think you should raise your hand. Thank you to all of you. I think there's a lot of people in here that, that are actually supporting you in, in different organizations. And, and I'd like to thank you for, for bringing these pictures out because this is needed to show for people to continue to support. Uh, there's discussions about increased, decreased support, and you are now doing a lot, a very important thing. This video is, the film is available on Swedish TV and SVT Play, 
uh, we can all tell our uh, friends to see this movie. And, and I also would like to say one more thing. The war doesn't stop here. Today, there's a volunteer, a woman in here, who actually fled Mariupol. I'm not going to... Can you come here, please? Can you, could you come here, please? You, where are you? I'm not sure if she understood the English I said, Angela. Uh, yes, this is Mariupol. Was Mariupol. This is Angela. And it was bad Mariupol, the son left 17 year old at that time. And she's been volunteering. She's been volunteering ever since to help the Ukrainian refugees here in Stockholm. And I, I would like to just see what, what you can continue to do when you leave here today. There's a web page called Ukrainians in Sweden. Dot se, where you can see how Sweden is supporting or not supporting the people who actually fled Mariupol today. So we, we need to improve how we take care of the refugees here in Sweden. There's a lot more we can do there. So please visit this website. Svenska Dag got it, had an editorial part this Thursday in an interview with me and the mom from, from uh, Ukraine. Listen to that and then you can also continue to support because the war doesn't stop, stop here in um, Mariupol. It continues uh, afterwards, and we need to care for those people affected by this, like Angela. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried. I live through this. We were in Mariupol all this time. And we left on 16th, so it's a day after we left. It was the day when the drum theater was bombed. When I watched this film, I cried a lot. And it seems that there could be more pain already. But it's impossible to forget. I don't want to cry when I think about it. I uh, have seen the truth here. And it is so real. And it's, it really was like that. Uh, I can't hold my emotions. But I'm happy we could leave the city with my son. It was very hard. We had to walk for 15 kilometers on foot, just with a cat and our passports. Our house, unfortunately, was bombed and it burned down. And I've seen all this horror. And it's so painful to think that your city doesn't exist anymore. I would like many people to see this film. And to see what terrible things Russia did. And I would like people in this room and people in general gave their respects. The volunteers and doctors who saved lives. We would like to have a minute of silence for them.
Thank you. I'm really grateful for people of Sweden who gave us shelter. And we used to survive. Right now, I don't know what our life will be in the future, but I'm very grateful to Sweden that we are here now in safety. And the volunteers that are here, thank you. For helping us to be part of your community. Everyone. Thank you for filming this and being in danger so the people so the people will remember what happened. Ukraine. But there are many more of these kids. 
and uh, but there are also people here is an example of Mariupol because I keep speaking to people who are stuck in Mariupol right now who didn't want to leave for various reasons those who didn't want to exchange their passports because there's like a forced policy to change your passport from Ukrainian to Russian if you don't you get you don't get medical uh, attention you can properly function within the society um, you get to get a house reconstructed, wh whatever, you just, you have no rights, you, you're basically in the ghetto. And you can't leave, actually. If you try to leave and you have just Ukrainian passport, they would just stop you on the checkpoint. And uh, if you're lucky, they would just send you back. But some of, some of, uh, some of these people got arrested, and some of those people who were arrested and uh, FSB kind of dig down in their in their past, in their phones, in their biographies, and they've seen some connections, any connections with the Ukrainian army or with the Ukrainian volunteers, they would get put them in jail. So there are currently several thousands of civilians in Russian jails that are treated as uh, uh, prisoners of war. So it is actually a hostage situation when a civilian is taken and turned into a person who will be exchanged later for a Russian soldier. It is clearly a hostage situation. And yes, there are not hundreds, there are thousands of these cases. And they're not just hostages, they're tortured and questioned and pressured, pressured psychologically. So since to, we had this uh, an investigation uh, several stories of these people who were just sent to dig trenches under the shelling. So basically, they are also used as a forced labor, basically slaves. So, yeah, thank you for bringing this up. We'll take one or two more questions. I think I see Maria is trying to raise her hand over there. That one, yeah. Do you have the question? important uh, these days not to forget what is going on in Ukraine and in particular what happened in Mariupol. So you told us that you're continuing your work and you're going to the front line and you speak to soldiers um, and you continue the documentation. So I would like to ask you, when you meet with the soldiers now fighting on the front line almost two years into the full-scale invasion, what are the messages that the soldiers want to you uh, to convey to the rest of the world. Thank you. You know, surprisingly, I uh, I would think they would uh, try to send a message to the world, uh, which would sound like we need more help, give us more weapons, give us uh, give us support as much as you can. But their message is, don't worry, we'll keep fighting will keep protecting the border of, of Europe. And it always surprises me. They never ask for stuff. They When they don't have enough drones, they uh, pay half of their salary, go and buy the drones and assemble them in, in their like a basement. And so they are, um, they are aware that It's it's up it's up to them. You, when when you fight for your for your land, you don't really you're grateful for help, but but uh, it's all on you. And yeah, they say don't worry, we keep fighting. They, yeah, that said to me too, because sometimes I get really pessimistic. Like oh my god, everything's bad, and they will be like, don't worry. Same thing they say to their moms, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, I'm fine, I'm wearing a hat and a helmet. There is not too much mice in our trench. Yeah, but they are tired, I can see. 
I can see that. I can see because if you're for two years, you are in the uh, in the trenches. You, for two years, you're fighting. You you, you go back, you go forward, and every 50 meters, every every like a 100 meters, there is someone's life. It's not just numbers, right? It's uh, someone's life. So. There is a lot of uh, sadness and loss, but they don't they don't give up seriously. They don't, and it's amazing actually. I'm quite inspired by that. Is there one last question? Microphone coming your way. Yeah, I would like to thank you too so much for uh, giving us this opportunity to. Uh, look at this film and uh, it must have been so hard to look at this all over and over again but it's really necessary for us to, to look at this and I wonder I mean as you see as this uh, medical staff is always the target and so are journalists and, and, and filmers and, and this kind of thing how are you working on that issue security uh, that I guess that has been a very important issue also for you and I also would like to ask about Disinformation, how do you look upon that, how it's made now in Ukraine? Yeah, actually this is somehow connected, because uh, in recent years, so I've been doing this conflict journalism for 10 years, which is definitely not enough to understand war and journalism, so I, I need more time to, to do that. But uh, I do see a trend a general trend, not only in authoritarian countries and totalitarian countries, and I also some democratic countries apply that uh, vision. They see information as a weapon, one of the most effective weapons in the modern warfare. And therefore, journalists uh, who don't comply with, uh, with the convenient narratives are becoming targets. And that's what I see constantly in past 10 years, journalists became more and more targets. In past 10 years, uh, there, has, there, have, there have been uh, various campaigns to undermine the trust to journalism in general, which, again, it makes attack on truth or on journalism, on objective, um, on objective reporting much more easier. For You know, if everyone called journalists prostitutes, or if everyone will just call them fake news, uh, then it's much easier for a regular folks just to hit you in the head and break your camera. It's just psychologically easier. So I do feel like over these years I'm becoming more and more a target, not only on the front lines. Uh, but seeing the doctors, seeing that they actually never stop, even under shelling, seeing, seeing firefighters who were trying to get people from under the rubble and extinguish fire even without water, you know, just with sand or... So people keep working regardless if they are being bombed, if they are being uh, neglected uh, or uh, threatened. And that gives me, uh, that gives me strength to, to, to overcome this attack on, on journalism. And I think uh, actually, it has been it has been part of our conversation a lot when we were editing the film because misinformation is part of the one of the important themes of of the film. And how do you actually react on on active misinformation, or shall we call it misinterpretation? Because it's not what is shown or not shown. Probably the images of Irina who lost her life along with her child were shown on the Russian TV as much as they were shown here or in Ukraine. But it was just a different comment on the top of it. <laughs> so it's misinterpretation. And again, the only way we can actually deal with that is, of course, education of the younger generation or ourselves, but also by uh, making a bigger stories, uh, making more uh, comprehensive, longer uh, stories like documentaries, that provide enough context to to be actually uh, able to resist this misinterpretation. It's much 
easier to find good meanings if you have just seen, if you just show clips, one minute, or two minutes uh, in the news, right? It's much harder to kind of misinterpret what you just saw um, for uh, 90 minutes. Although 90 minutes is not enough, of course, it's not enough. But yeah, so we just have to kind of keep working and if you try, even if you try to fight with propaganda, you lost immediately. Be just because you are, that's what they want you to, they want you to be on their level and, and then you lost. Just keep, uh, keep working, I guess, keep going forward. Last, just a, a hopeful, small hopeful note for you. I left Mariupol and I was already editing the film, so I was in a big, big, really bad state of mind. And uh, I was invited to Rome uh, to the media conference, and, uh, the small awards. So I flew there. It was the first time I actually left Ukraine uh, after a few months of, uh, of the beginning of full scale invasion. And I, I flew to Rome, uh, from Poland, and uh, I was driving through Rome and um, I was driving along with my friend uh, who was, uh, uh, well, I haven't seen for a long time. Anyway, I was looking, I was looking in the window and I've seen this bright city, happy people, uh, vibrant colors, uh, celebration, tourists, and I just couldn't, I was, I couldn't stop seeing destruction, I couldn't stop seeing uh, death. And loss, and I said, I said to my friend, look, I, I just, I just can't, can't see this now. Uh, these people are so happy. How can they live? <laughs> uh, I keep thinking about Mariupol all this time. And he told me, Mr. Slav, do you know how many times Rome was burned to the ground and occupied? And look at it now. So I, I guess humans have just amazing amazing ability to to get back to life together and i hope that's what's going to happen to to ukraine